Today down in the comments, I want to hear about your favorite no-budget movies. I'm not talking low-budget independent movies. I'm not talking Charles Band and Roger Corman. I'm not talking small movies. Uh, I'm not talking shoestring uh, by Hollywood standards. I'm talking shoestrings by Midwestern standards. I'm talking uh, shot on weekends with no money and with friends. Uh, I'm talking those kinds of movies. Hello, this is Project Black T-Shirt, the channel where we take a horror movie or multiple horror movies and then pair them with a book recommendation that you will enjoy reading if you like those movies. I'm Adam Caesar. I am the author of Clown in a Cornfield, uh, the recently uh, Bram Stoker nominated Clown in a Cornfield, and several other books that you can go read or listen to on audiobook or get the ebook if you enjoy uh, spooky, scary, uh, blood and guts, all that kind of stuff. If you enjoy the stuff we talk about on this channel, basically. If you like this video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe so you can watch more videos like it. And today we are talking about uh, one of my most anticipated releases of the year. This is uh, the Homegrown Horror Set, uh, Volume 1. This is put out by people we love at Vinegar Syndrome. This, When this was announced, this, this really did kind of extend beyond the typical uh, sec section or subsection of my Twitter feed, uh, of my Facebook feed. Of my of Facebook groups where um, where one when Vinegar Syndrome when VS does uh, doesn't announce we all go crazy all my friends in the group text are like oh what is this one oh I saw that one back in the oh this is good this is this is the same director as this like usually we do that uh, among my friends but this definitely felt like and I don't know whether it was just uh, a lucky bounce or whether I um, I kind of uh, was seeing what I want to see but this really did feel like the interest to this set. Um, extended beyond the typical uh, audience for Vinegar Syndrome. Uh, so as soon as it came in, uh, I, I, I watched all the films in a row. They are, um, we're going to talk about them in slightly different order, but they are Fatal Exam, uh, Beyond Dream's Door, and Winter Beast. These are three, uh, this beautiful set, three kind of separately boxed, separately um, jewel-cased uh, releases. Uh, of these films and this it should it has to be stressed I know it I know you can clearly see that this is quality but it has to be stressed that these uh, are not the types of films you would typically associate with huge uh, expansive special edition releases um, Vinegar Syndrome is usually does that but they almost they kind of outdid themselves with the amount of special features and the amount of care um, put into these uh, three films that really might not otherwise uh, get it. These are movies that are um, that for a long time were kind of uh, relegated to VHS, uh, and then uh, in the case of I think in the case of Winter Beast, when there was a DVD, it was like self-released DVDs. Vinegar Syndrome went all out for these movies, um, and even beyond, even before we talk about the quality of the movies themselves, they really should be commended for doing that because wow, this is this is incredible. But I think just because of that eye-catching, this, this is all new art. This is not what these movies. Uh, originally look like. I'll put up the uh, posters for them as we talk about them, the original posters or the original uh, box art for them. Uh, but these are all regional horror movies. All of them were shot over a series of years. Uh, almost all of them were shot kind of piecemeal on weekends uh, by a close group of friends and uh, collaborators and uh, in some cases uh, uh, classmates. Uh, but these are these are all three great examples of regional horror and yet all three are very, very different from each other. These are these these movies kind of couldn't be more different, at least um, in genre and execution. Um, and yet they all it makes sense that you bought them and they all came in this in this set, this homegrown horrors uh, volume one, which would imply more volumes, which I can't wait for. But enough, John, about just the sets and the set in general. Uh, let's talk about these movies. Uh, let's talk about which ones work, which ones. Uh, I wasn't as big a fan of it, and then we'll, we'll we'll give our final judgment on this um, on the set. Talk about them in the order I watched them, which means that 1989's Beyond Dreams Door, uh, sometimes stylized with the apostrophe on dreams, sometimes not. Uh, here it doesn't have it, um, but Beyond Dreams Door. All of these, when I say like 1989 or 1990 or 1992, those are all kind of not representative of the era of filmmaking that these represent because they were all shot uh, multiple years over several years, all during the 80s. But Beyond Dream's Door, here's kind of that original uh, art here, is the most professional of the three. This is the, this is the film that, that feels the most finished, that feels 
the most like a, for lack of a better term, quote unquote, real movie. Uh, Beyond Dreams Door has, has some clear um, professionalism to it. This was shot in Ohio and everyone, uh, and most of the creatives involved in it uh, were, uh, were graduates of the Ohio State. They were graduates of Ohio State. And then they came back and they made a bunch of short films. They'd even made a short version of Beyond Dreams Door. The director, Jay Wolfell, was like, what if we do a feature version before he moves out to LA, before he just tries to make his bones um, in the film industry? What if we make a feature uh, and maybe we can get distribution for it? So Beyond Dreams Door was, was his brainchild. It's a really hard movie to kind of um, synopsize. Because it's not a direct uh, adaptation of a Lovecraft story, but it has kind of Lovecraftian elements to it. Uh, we basically, for the first little bit, we really don't know what's going on. We're, we're focused on this character and he kind of keeps doing that thing where he's like waking up for a dream, but he's not, it doesn't even seem like he's sleeping at the time. It's not like a narcolepsy thing. He's just having these dreams and his dreams are influencing his real life. Um, and it's, it's almost to the point where it's um, almost surrealistic. It almost feels like uh, like experimental in a way. It almost feels like uh, Louis Bunuel and Salvador Dali. It's, it feels that that weird and that disconnected. And then things start to mesh as he's going to this. Um, he's he's uh, a student at the university. He's going to the he's going to get a sleep study in the sleep lab. They find him very interesting. And the doctor, the head of the sleep lab, kind of takes this case and, and really runs with it and tries to figure out what's what's up with him. And he's got two TAs. He's got two um, kind of. Um, students under him that that he hands off to that could kind of become the main investigators of this. Uh, it is very surreal, very weird, um, but very uh, effects heavy and a lot of stuff's happening. There's all this, there's, he's being chased by a monster in his dream and, and people are dying and then they're coming back as kind of these dream ghouls like we see here. Um, not only do you, if you die in the dream, you die in real life kind of thing do we get going, but like the dream itself is is chasing this guy and it's erasing it as it kills people it's kind of erasing them from existence someone dies and he tries to go back to their house and their house is gone like the entire it's just an empty lot it's a really really it's a full of interesting ideas uh and they're all executed really um really simply uh but with a lot of like i said uh and we won't really have in the later films but with a lot of like technical competency uh, and a little bit of filmmaking pizzazz, uh, but they shot on 16 millimeter. The movie looks great. There are moments uh, that kind of switches to tape because uh, even though they made this from the, they made this uh, scan from the camera negative, they'd lost uh, a roll or two of film. So they couldn't quite reconstruct it exactly right, but they used tape in some of it. It looks great though. Um, and there's a, there's a really significant making of documentary on here. That's like, I don't know, I, I forget. Now they're all starting to run together, but this one, this one's at least a half hour, maybe even longer, it's close to an hour, but it's really inspiring. I'm not even, I don't make movies, I'm not a filmmaker, but I found it inspiring. Uh, so I can only imagine if you, if you make movies um, and if you want to kind of hear the, the kind of inside baseball ins and outs of like, they don't make them like they used to. And it's like, here's why. Um, it's because they had access to this equipment and because they were shooting on real film and very, very interesting. Uh, very interesting movie. One of the most interesting movies in the set. Not my favorite movie, though. We will we will talk about that. Um, but uh, really just, it would be worth getting if this were a standalone disc. I'll, I'll say that. Next, we have Winter Beast. And of the, of the three with this newly commissioned art, uh, Winter Beast looks like the coolest, baddest-ass monster on the cover. Um, not really representative of the monsters you get in the movie, but what it lacks in maybe quality of monsters, it makes up for in, in quantity. This is the shortest movie in the set. This movie is 70 minutes um, and it really flies. Uh, here is the original uh, cover, which you might be more familiar with because I think uh, Red Letter Media did this uh, a while ago as one of their best or the worst. Uh, but this is a, uh, a, a bizarre movie. This, this movie makes absolutely no sense. And I don't even mean that. I don't mean that in the Dolly, uh, impressionistic, experimental way that I meant when I talked about Dream's Door. I mean, this 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 movie barely fits together. Uh, there's um, very little continuity. There's very little attempt to, we have like these three or four-ish main characters that kind of enter and exit um, seemingly at random. Only real story to hold on to we're in Western Massachusetts, Northern Massachusetts, kind of bumping up against New Hampshire. I think some of it might've been shot in New Hampshire. Um, and we're focusing on this town uh, where the park rangers 
are, are, are experiencing park rangers are going missing and people are going missing and they want this, um, this guy who's recently reopened the Wild Goose Lodge, who's recently reopened this, um, this kind of tourist attraction and, uh, and lodge, they want him to stop, to stop having people there. And of course he's, he doesn't want to. And they think it's, they think it's connected to this Native American curse they think it's connected to this portal from different realms, which is why there's different uh, demons like the demon we have here, which is, you know, spoiler alert, it's kind of like the final demon, but we have all kinds of different predominantly stop motion animated monsters that show up at seemingly random times um, that look very different from one another. Um, but what it lacks in sense and cohesion more than makes up for in entertainment value. Winter Beast is... Uh, despite large chunks of it taking place during the summer and fall, Winter Beast, um, there's, a, there's one or two shots with like snow on the ground. But this is uh, a riotous, in, insane movie. Uh, I really, really, really appreciate it. It varies between there's there's it varies between like what they what medium they even shot on. Some of it's 16 millimeter, some of it's eight millimeter. Um, it is it is thrown together with. Uh, bubblegum and uh, chutzpah and like kind of let's make a movie charm um there's these weird sets like uh, the lodge itself and the the ranger station they're 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 made in people's houses and they just the sets feel so small and weird and cramped and they're decorated with all this like ticky tacky tchotchkes from uh massachusetts uh small towns from like the mohawk trail and stuff like that it gives it, it gives it this really really weird really destabilizing um, effect to the movie. Like you, you watch this movie and it, you could watch this movie stone sober. Um, you probably want to watch it with a couple beers, but if you watch this stone sober, you will feel a weird kind of like, am I hallucinating this? Is this, do I have a head injury? Do I need to go to the hospital? Do I have a brain bleed? That's the kind of movie this is. And I really, really am, am very sparing in my use of, um, so bad it's good. Cause I don't really like that just generally as a concept. Um, but as far as outsider art goes, as far as weird, um, not strictly good in any kind of textbook or cinematic sense, um, as far as those movies goes, fantastic. <laughs> really, really, like, in my heart of hearts and in my mind, I know that Beyond Dreams Door is, is a much better film um, on every level. But there's something so charming about Winter Beast that probably makes it my favorite in the set. The special features on this one are good. They're not as good as on the other two, which is a real shame because um, because you kind of want to know the most about this. And they're also this is also the one where because of COVID, because of when these were produced, um, there's a lot awful lot of uh, people on Zoom calls, people on Skype. It's not that great a quality. It's the information is good. The information in part is good, and it's a it's a real love letter to this movie. Um, you get a hell of a lot more special features than you'd think you would get. The The biggest kind of special feature on here is an interview with Mark Frizzell, and he does, he records a new commentary too, so that's like a half hour talk with him. He's really passionate, really interesting, really weird kind of guy, and you can tell um, Winter Beast kind of comes from that weirdness. Um, and then there's uh, archival holdover stuff. Him and the director, Christopher Theus, when they'd uh, originally put the DVD out, they did a kind of side-by-side -side interview um, and a making of and reminiscing about making this movie. Uh, but it is, it is incredibly weird. Um, no amount of context from special features will, will prepare you for how strange it is and how it doesn't work at all, but yet so works. Uh, great movie. The last movie in the set was honestly the one I was looking forward to the most in this in this set just because it seems so weird and because it it you know from the from the cover it looks like a slasher even though it's kind of not and the director even talks about how he doesn't like slashers uh, but this is called fatal exam uh, and this is a this is a very plot heavy one and it actually has a plot that makes sense it has reveals and, and structures this is in some ways this is a, a more traditional movie than even beyond dreams door but this is a, a shot on 16 millimeter shot completely. Uh, shot on silent 60 millimeter, like wind up bolexes and stuff like that. So they 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 had to dub and remix every every sound you hear in this movie is added after the fact. Um, but fatal exam, a group of students, they're in college, they're all worried about finals, and their parapsychology class, um, the the teacher, the professor, um, offers them this project instead of uh, in lieu of a typical final, and the project is to go out to this house that had a series of murders, series of kind of ritualistic murders happen, uh, that the state owns it, and that they're 
interested in doing studies because they've, they've heard that there are, you know, s supernatural occurrences happening at this house. Uh, so they all go, a group of like uh, not, uh, six or seven or eight or I think nine of them uh, go to this, uh, go to this house out in the sticks. This is filmed in, um, this is filmed outside St. Louis, Missouri. And one of the characters has a Cardinals uh, thing on the whole time. So it does have some local flavor there. Um, but they get there and they set up all their equipment and then, you know, they start kind of getting 10 little Indians to, where people start disappearing. Weird stuff keeps happening. And then there's this reveal that some of it might not be uh, as supernatural as it appears. So this is a movie that kind of works in two halves where we have the supernatural stuff, which may or may not be real. And then we have the kind of very terrestrial, very kind of uh, conspiracy minded back half of the second and, and third and full third act uh, where we have uh, our hero, his his sister and the guy who's dating his, his sister are kind of trying to unravel this mystery almost Scooby-Doo style. And we've got hooded figures with like large scythes, like beating people up and cutting people up. And it's, it's, it's really, I'm making it sound maybe better and more interesting than it is. Cause the thing about final exam, uh, the thing about fatal exam, which I'm going to keep calling final exam, which is another slasher, which is totally unrelated, uh, that I'm going to have to edit out. But the thing about Fatal Exam is that it's two hours long. It's a pretty darn long movie uh, for kind of a no-budget uh, movie with like two locations. There's like the school and then there's the house. Um, it's, it's a fairly talky and fairly uneventful movie. But even still, even saying that and as I'm like thinking about it and as I'm thinking about the weirdness of it and how it ends and the fact that there's this like they find this painting that they have to like unravel all these kind of Indiana Jones clues to try to figure out uh, what's going on and what conspiracy and mystery they're in the in the middle of and there's this whole political subplot where we're hearing about like a, a, a presidential bid going on on the radio as I talk about it I'm convincing myself more and more that I liked it um, because it, it is hell of an ambitious movie uh, for a movie shot over several years on weekends where all the people involved with it are friends. Some of them are complete non-actors. Some of them doing the special effects were like learning how to do special effects, learning how to compose, learning how to do all this stuff while they were uh, doing this. Just for this one guy, Jack Snyder is his name. Uh, and he's gone, gone on to do a bunch of uh, DTV and VOD movies that are pretty recent and have stars in them you've heard. Uh, but this is his first feature and it's really made on that like chutzpah of like, we've made a couple shorts now, why don't we try to make a feature? Uh, let's make a two hour, uh, very talky movie that we're gonna have to dub later. And it's just, it's there's there's even a little bit of stop motion in it. There's even a little bit of, there's some gore, there's some interesting kills, there's some action scenes with that are insanely choreographed. Um, it just doesn't quite, it's not as zippy and it's not as um, as kind of crowd pleasing as the other two movies in the set. But as I talk about it, as I think about it, yes, it is the lesser of the three, but that's, it's, that's, not, that's not to say it's not worth watching. That's not to say it's not worth owning. That's not to say it's not worth thinking about um, and engaging with. Yeah, and this is also, like, uh, like Beyond Dream's Door, this has a, a really pretty long, pretty, uh, in, pretty great newly produced uh, documentary uh, where they all get to, a lot of the uh, a lot of the people that made it kind of get together they're in like this private theater and it's nice to see the all these these older gentlemen uh, who made this movie when they were kids uh, kind of come back together and, and talk about it so fondly and all the fun they had and how uh, Snyder met his wife on the set she's one of the stars of it um, then she got married literally while they were making it to another guy uh, and then they got together later it's, it's really like it's a nice movie uh, it's a nice uh, making of documentary because it really reminds you of the little communities that get built uh, when you make a film like this. If you if you can't pick up uh, on my the, the tone of my voice, whether or not the Homegrown Horror Volume 1 uh, set is worth it or not, uh, it's hella worth it. Uh, it's so, so worth it. Uh, not only for the films themselves that have never looked this good, um, but for the uh, the special features, which are incredibly above and beyond and incredibly exhaustive. Uh, I, I hope they do many more volumes of this. I hope there are many more films like this for them to find to put out, and I'm sure there are, um, but geez, uh, you know, Missouri, uh, Massachusetts, and, and Ohio, you get a real tour of the United States, you get a real tour of what filmmaking was like uh, in the mid 80s to late 80s to 90, early 90s, um, but man, 
get this, uh, and I hope they make more sets like it. This week's book rec recommendation is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, I am recommending Clive Barker's Books of Blood, and kind of because one of the movies prompted me to do that. Um, in Beyond Dream's Door, uh, there's you can you can see because of this new pristine transfer, you can see kind of the books on the back of one of the bookshelves, and uh, the main character has uh, Clive Barker's In the Flesh, which is Books of Blood, Volume Five, was released in other territories, but here it was released just as, as In the Flesh on its own. Um, yeah, that's that's the one with uh, with the Forbidden, which is the Candyman story. All of the books of blood are great. Uh, Cabal is great, which is uh, in one of them. Um, if you have not read the books of blood by Clive Barker, uh, watching these movies and and reading some kind of horror fiction that made a splash in the eighties uh, makes a lot of sense. And you you see kind of even if Barker would only really start influencing things once he started making his own films and. Um, once he became more of a household name, you see his influence and in what what was going on uh, at the time, and that kind of energy transfuses to at least this movie because you you see it in the background and you're like, oh, the filmmakers must have been reading Barker at the time they were making some of this. Um, but yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the book recommendation for this week. Uh, the book again is Clown in the Cornfield. Uh, anyone who's picked it up, anyone who's picked up any of my other books and reviewed them and told their friends about them, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I will see you next week where we will continue talking about horror movies and horror fiction and just, we just love this spooky stuff, don't we?